Welcome, everybody, back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited to have a very special person to me here in the studio. I'm not entirely sure that he's all that excited, but then again, you can never tell when Brad Armstrong is excited or not excited. So, Brad, tell us, how excited are you to be here today? Between your cleavage and your high heels that you're wearing for me, <laughs> Daddy's excited. I had to find some way to keep your attention. Yeah. So Good you're, work. Thank you. Thank you. I did my best. So thank you so much for coming. I've been bugging Brad to come on this show for a long time. A long time. A long time. And he was always... Always turn me down. You don't really do interviews, do you? I'm not. I, I'm not one that likes to hear myself talk that much. Really? Because you wouldn't know that from Twitter. Hey, I've toned <laughs> my Twitter down in like I'm you like have a big time. You have in the last two years. You for have. Sure. You just like to argue with people. I don't even anymore. Hardly ever. Hmm. You must not be not, might be following me that closely nowadays. I mean, to be fair, I guess that's true because I haven't seen. Yeah, a no, lot of arguments. Hardly any shit talking at all. What? Maybe the president, but that's about it. Well, or his it's hard not entourage. to do that. Why, um, what, what is, why have you turned over a new leaf? As you get older, you realize that very little matters. <laughs> <laughs> and arguing with strangers on Twitter yeah, is not one of the things that yeah, matter. I don't even argue with people I know anymore. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Like, who cares? <laughs> shut up. So what did I actually change your mind about coming on the show? Was it just because well, I... Well, now you have some followers and shit. Oh, no. some followers. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, That's I what hear, it was. I, it's like the last, what, six months or so you've been bragging about your your uh, all your people that are... My views. YouTube numbers? Your views. So I said, well, maybe it's worth driving all the way fucking down here. Well, see, I had to brag it's about like it little, in order to get you in, here. in the middle of like in downtown, what's this, Chinatown? Koreatown. Koreatown. One of those. Maybe Let's, you're the one who lives far away. Because you do live like off the 118. Yeah. That's kind of far. It's, it's tranquil. It is tranquil. It is not tranquil here. No. I mean, in not. your little abode right here, it's yeah. very nice. Yeah. The outside world is hovering around us with their. Outside world is hovering. Many diseases. <laughs> I saw a lot of masks down there in that street, man. <laughs> <laughs> they all had their. Like their <laughs> Masks were everywhere. Very are, Asian population where, where we're at right now. Are you scared about the coronavirus? What do you think about it? Or do you think it's like a big hype? Eh, plague. Just <laughs> another plague coming down to ravage like, humanity. They deserve it. <laughs> do you, what do you think about the state of the world? Like, do you think that That's we're a, headed towards an mess. apocalypse or? I mean, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to go at any moment. <laughs> I'm good. I had, a, I had a good 55 year, 54 and a half years. So I'm like, I'm covered. So you're, so if you died tomorrow, if we like a tsunami came and wiped us all out tomorrow, you'd be fine with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I had a good life. I can't complain. <laughs> so what? All I'm going to do from here on in is get older. That's true. Older, less attractive, less sex. You know, it's, it's, it, there's no upside here. Like if I, unless I win the lottery, it's like, it's on the, I'm on the downslide, you know? <laughs> I really love the positive outlook that you have on life. It's in, so inspiring. Picture me as my Canadian brother Quasar, only without the humor. <laughs> oh my God. And the booze. A, maybe you just need more booze and then you'd be, yeah, you know. you'd be more humorous. You really don't need two quasars in this world. That's true. The world can only handle one. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. He's got it covered. He's handling it well. Yeah. He says that he's cut down to just drinking wine now. That must have been after New Year's. <laughs> oh, right. You saw him on New Year's. I was partying with him on New Year's. Yeah. I heard that that whole party turned into like a bit of an orgy situation. And I tried my best. He made no, a quick no, exit. Nobody was biting at all. You tried to incite the orgy, orgy and it didn't go anywhere? No, it fell flat. You that know what? Back in the day, orgies broke out at porn parties all the time, like on the regular. Really? But now, nothing, man. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think it's between OnlyFans, everybody wants to save their seed for content mm. and hooking and everybody's got to save their pussy because you know it's all that stuff it's it's a different world out there do you think it's also too because people everybody has a camera on them and so 
someone can film basically anything that you're doing so that it feels like there's no like privacy. Yeah, because just in case they become fucking politicians, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, you've done 6,000 scenes. This, no, I don't think – I don't think I don't, I don't think the drunken New, York, New Year's orgy is going to be the breaker. <laughs> so – Brad, you have been in the industry a long time. How long now? Fucking long time. 30 years was my first movie. 1989. Years. Wow. And tell us about tell us about how you got into the industry. I was a cute little uh, stripper in Canada. Mm-hmm. And Playgirl Magazine had a Men of Canada special. Mm-hmm. So I got in that. They used a bunch of the dancers. Uh, and then uh, they shot me solo and did a calendar and all that. And then from there, uh, when the magazine came out, I met Erica Boyer, who was stripping in Toronto, who was mm-hmm. back in the day. On the, anybody of, of a certain age knows who Erica Boyer was, uh, one of the, the golden era porn stars. Mm-hmm. And she was just making a comeback. And I met her in Toronto, and I walked up to her and showed her my little Playgirl magazine layout. And I, I said, you were going to say something else. No, I, I, I showed her my penis later. Uh, so I, I, uh, I showed her my little layout and I said, hey, trying to get into business, do you think you can help me? And she looked me up and down and looked at my layout and then we fucked all that week. And then she brought so me she down. she was testing you. She was checking me out. And then strangely enough, she was, like I said, she was just about to do a comeback and she uh, brought me down to visit your mom at her studio. And your mom was the first person to to shoot uh, me and Erica. She shot us like three days that week. Uh, Boy, girl for Playgirl magazine, I think High Society and something else. Um, but yeah, your mom was was instrumental in my career. Hence the reason. I love here. you so much. I know. You're only nice to me because of my mom. Hey, nepotism is awesome. <laughs> never, never stray away. So can you tell us about what your first shoots were like? Like, were you nervous? Did well, you have first, any struggle? The first one was an epic movie called Bowling Bimbos from Boston. <laughs> and it, awesome. it was the sequel, sequel from Bowling Bimbos from Buffalo. It did so well. They're making a second one. Wow. So this is 89 was before tests. Right. So literally, they flew me down, picked, had someone pick me up at the airport, drove me straight to the bowling alley that they had rented for the evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm in front of Mike Horner, Randy Spears, Eric Price, uh, all these dudes who I'd seen movies of. And I'm going, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> and so we're doing all the acting. And I didn't have much because they didn't know what I could do. So right. then we're in a six-person orgy. It's kind of it makes sense though to throw you into an orgy because if you can't perform, you can kind goes, of hide. Goes in the back. both ways, yeah. yeah. So a a lot more stress because you're looking at two other dudes who are rocking away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that scene did not go that great. Like I struggled through it, but it was a tough one. But yeah, then you get kind of buried in the background and you're you know disappear. Uh, and then the next one was called Headlock, and that was a Tori Wells movie. And uh, it was a wrestling movie. They set up a wrestling ring in someone's backyard. And it was supposed to be like a big fundraiser wrestling thing. And I was Dan the Devastator. (laughs) And uh, that scene, I did good. It was just me and Erica in a tub. Um, And then the third was uh, something about something fantasies. And it was me, Erica, and Tammy Monroe back in the day. Okay. And those were my first three. And this is before Viagra. A decade before Viagra, maybe yeah. a decade and a half. So I think a lot of people don't realize what. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to shoot movies back before Viagra came along and what it's like now? Well, back then, like almost every movie was in a day. So you'd be shooting five scenes in a day plus dialogue. Right. A big movie, a huge movie was two days. Yeah. So literally, there was no time to fuck around. That's why back in the day, you only saw 10 guy performers mm-hmm. because. There was no time to wait or dink around, and there yeah. was no Viagra to help. Um, so it was, it was, it was make or break. And you basically had probably about three movies, whatever your in was. Like mine was Erica. Whatever your in was, you had about three movies to prove that you could do it, or you're long gone. Mm. And so that's why you know back in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, there's literally ten 
questionably good looking uh, <laughs> uh, guys in the business, you know, and uh, those who could act because every movie was a story. Mm-hmm. And because you only had Lonzo didn't exist, back you had then. one take, two takes max to, to do your lines, you know, because it, it was a day. Mm-hmm. So one day wonders were that's that was what it was. It's so interesting because I've heard this from so many people. And for some reason, I had this idea. And I think a lot of other people did, too, that like. There was a lot more money in porn back then, and so movies were shot over a longer period of time. That was that was when you're kicking into the 70s when okay. they were making it. You know, everything was shot on film, and mm-hmm. and it was basically out of work mainstream people that got into porn. By right. by by the 90s, it had been uh, decimated to one day wonders. And uh, what do you think that was? Because this is before the internet came along. It's just everybody's still the the invention of uh, the VCR mm-hmm. and and uh, beta and videotapes and stuff like that. So uh, they had already like like porn does trying to make things for cheaper and cheaper. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's a vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. So and basically that's what happened back then. It was everything was trying to do it as cheap as they could, and then a couple of uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, owners started doing better and better and better. Like Steve, that's how I ended up with uh, with Steve Ornstein from Wicked. Uh, but there was you know a handful of companies that were starting to make movies better and better and spend more on it because they they started to kind of change the game and uh, uh, show that quality could survive and you could charge more. <clears throat> sorry, mm-hmm. uh, charge more for a better quality product. Mm. And that's based. Luckily that was just about the time that I started deciding to direct because Mm -hmm. I had, I had seen uh, all these bad, bad movies and been in tons of movies and all my buddies from Canada going, Hey, send us some stuff up. And I was like, so embarrassed by what was going on. (laughs) And I said, there has to be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had no film school background or anything. My background was commercial art and advertising. So I knew how to make things aesthetically pretty. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started. I started doing vignettes where they were like just making them as cool and pretty as I could for the budget we had. And then slowly we started uh, spending more and more on it. And uh, I started getting right, my writing chops together. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Is this with Wicked or did you yeah, start directing I'll, for another <clears throat> company first? My first movie I self-financed because okay. basically I said this – Nobody's going to give me a shot. I haven't done a ton of movies. Mm -hmm. So I'd I'd sold my house up in Canada when I moved down here. I packed Mm -hmm. up my van and drove down. Um, And uh, I think I cleared more or less. I had a a nest egg of about 40 grand. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, um, I was dating Diane Loren. Mm. And uh, she was just about to start doing porn. I was just about to get back into porn because I'd been in Canada for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, so we decided to get in together and we decided to make our own movie. And so we did all the stuff for free and I put $12,500 into the movie. And as luck would have it, uh, another lucky thing, like I met your mom and that was lucky mm. as luck would have it. Vivid was just about to sign Diana. So they said, Oh, you got a movie in the can already. And they bought it. So that was my calling card was oh vivid just bought my first movie i directed oh wow yeah that's a big and deal i ended up yeah because back then that, back then vivid was huge yeah and yeah. and they they had all their in-house production they didn't buy outside movies mm-hmm. so that's how i ended up ended up at east coast video show and uh standing at a bar beside steve ornstein the owner of wicked he had just started uh wicked six months before mm-hmm. he was waiting for people i was waiting for people we ended up striking a conversation what do you do what do you do and that was how I was my am I in? I said, oh, I just sold my first movie to Vivid. He's like, what? So after a bunch of uh, lunches at Brent's Deli, uh, <laughs> we, he, he agreed to give me some money. And uh, the uh, the Wicked Armstrong team was born. At that time, I was doing one month Vivid, one month Wicked. And I did that for about a year. Mm-hmm. And then they both offered me contracts. And I decided to go to Wicked. Why did you decide to go to Wicked? I me and Steve just had a, a definite... Uh, a similar outlook of what we wanted to do mm-hmm. in the movie business. Mm-hmm. Steve's also like a really nice guy. Super nice guy. And I've not heard the same about uh, the other one. I, I get along with 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 uh, Steve Hirsch pretty good too. Uh, but the mom and him just always clash. Oh really? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we, we, that was over ginger. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, uh, they both treated me well. 
uh, and now it's been uh, 25 years wow. since uh, since uh, a little actually a little more 25 years since like, my first movie for Wicked. Wow. So and almost next year it'll be 25 under contract. Do you have any idea how many movies you shot for them? I think I'm creeping up on 200 total. Jesus. So I think probably 150 of those are are wicked. Okay. I had to guess wow. somewhere around there. It's a lot. Yeah, the, I certainly the the 90 percent, maybe more, are are wicked titles. What do you think is the best? Could so, you pick one? Okay, so could, could you pick I, a couple? I mean, I I I can narrow it down to like a top ten. You okay. know what I mean? There's there's so many that that I'm really proud of over the years. Uh, some for different reasons, others others for like the just the general aesthetic of them, others the story, others like how fucking hard it was to get them done and it was yeah. actually just, just the fact that they got completed at all. Yeah. Uh what was, was the most difficult movie you worked on? Euphoria. Euphoria yeah. was the toughest. We had so much shit go wrong on that movie and uh and, and they got some a lot of times it's the ones that are the bears to make are the ones like that one won like 13 avn awards or something like that wow. um it was euphoria was definitely my toughest movie it was it was a disaster what went wrong just everything we, we were at a studio and the whole lighting grid came down i remember you told me this yeah, it like was a huge huge like the whole room of lighting grid like like a 40 by 40 room just fucking basically every light that i had on that thing it was a big huge sex club thing yeah and um you know 10 minutes before it happened we, we'd done all the stills and we'd done all the dialogue and we decided to take a break uh, before we started the sex. Oh, my and God. And it was, it was probably a 20, 20 by 20 set and it was all glass uh, walls with neon everywhere. And behind the glass walls, there was sex shows. And then the main stage had a sex show and then all, you know, 10, 15 extras on top of that. So there was... You know, eight or ten sex players plus fifteen. There's like twenty five people there plus crew. It would have been like forty people there back in the day when, because that was one of the biggest movies I've ever done. Uh, in that room when it all came crashing down. Luckily, glass and neon and shit like that got popped. But uh, we got so lucky and everybody band together. We uh, took all the lights off. Uh, got rid of the the metal beams that were the 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 grid. Threw it all outside and put all the lights on stands again and carried on. Like it was, we, we made it through the day. Wow. And that was just one. We had a, we had a makeup trailer and all of a sudden the guy driving the makeup trailer sees the wheel pass him on the freeway. Oh, wait, and wait. One of the wheels of the makeup trailers fucking falling off and shit. Just every, everything about it was a disaster. So that lighting grid thing is really scary because no, if people, people, people if, easily could have died on that. We just, oh, we can got you imagine so if you were in the middle of shooting an orgy, can you imagine the headlines? Like, Oh, yeah. 40 porn people die in the yeah, midst every, of like... Okay, not everybody would have died, but it certainly could have could yeah. have landed on a couple of heads for sure. Oh, yeah. my God. That's so And scary. it was just, just lucky that we took the break. I was saying, okay, let's take 10 minutes. Everybody do whatever they want to do before sex and, and uh, wow. have a drink, do whatever you're going to do. And, uh, and just luck of the draw. I can't believe you actually finished the scene that day too. And we did another one. We had one where where it was uh, we had in in ceiling sprinklers, mm -hmm. and new lighted guy put a put a light a big light right underneath like big, the sprinkler. Yeah, yeah. Like All of a sudden, I. yeah, we're shooting big orgy scene. It was one of the uh, wicked uh, wicked part. Huh, what are they called? Shit. Anyway, we did used to do these big orgies for wicked mm -hmm. wicked like it was a big orgy party, and all of a sudden we're shooting. 10, 12 people, and all of a sudden we hear this. Ooh. We're all looking around. What the fuck is that? And all of a sudden, sprinklers pop. Oh my god! All over the fucking place, and we actually squeegeed all the uh, all the water out. And the chick was cool. We ended up ended up doing about thirty five hundred dollars damage to the floors, but yeah. we, we ended up shoot, finishing the scene. And the lights didn't pop. No, well, it was just one that was right underneath that. But everybody grabbed all the cameras, ran outside. Oh my god! Yeah, it just yeah, it was, I have some good war stories. Yeah. Usually I find that, like, for me, all of the biggest disaster stories, the war stories that people want to hear, it's almost always has to do with the location, not necessarily with the performers. 
I mean, the performers, you can always work around it, whether they're replaced or, or whatever it is. It's, but there's, yeah, you know, the cops showing up or whatever, whatever. It's That's always, always a fun one, you lo- know. Location varied. You know, I, we did one big scene. We were outside during the day and it was a big FBI sting kind of thing. And Sidney Steele was there with her hands up in the middle of the street. And all these guys have their guns and they're like, look, very, very real FBI-ish. Yeah. And like six hours later, all of a sudden, it was like Vice is there with like six undercover dudes and all their badges and their guns and shit. It's going, what's going on? I'm going, uh, we we're just shooting a movie. And we were permitted and all that. And they saw the guns, so they made us stay away from the guns and checked that they were all fake and stuff. But it's like, yeah, you're six hours late. <laughs> but yeah, had it been the other way around and they showed up on time. Yeah, it would have been really ugly because all like I had six guys there with guns and and handguns and shotguns and all that shit in the middle of the street wearing FBI badges and stuff. Oh my god! So somebody <laughs> called the cops thinking that like I, this girl was actually yeah. I I don't know what what the deal was, but like yeah, we I had all my guys in FBI jackets and stuff <laughs> like that and all screeching to all and the whole yeah, bulletproof vests and guns and but it was like literally six hours later they roll in. But it was really funny. That would actually be really funny if they kind of tried to play the whole, like, well, we're FBI and you're just regular cops, so, like, yeah. we have jurisdiction here. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, there's always fun stories. Yeah. Not so much now because you don't have the money to make fun stories. Now it's a lot more <laughs> – now it's a lot more girl two with boy three on couch four. Yeah. You know? And that's that's what a lot of porn has become. Yeah. How much of your budget shrank? Like, oh, you don't have to give me numbers, but, like, uh, percentage-wise, would you say? I'm shooting now between – half to a third and sometimes a quarter. Yeah. And you still get the big budgets too. Like yeah, comparatively. Compar- comparatively speaking. Yeah. yeah. Steve, Steve's really good with me. He's still, you know, we started to make good movies. Mm-hmm. We had the same outlook. And I mean, unfortunately, I mean, we'd, we'd still be doing it. And he probably, he probably tried to hold out mm-hmm. uh, as long, uh, way longer than most mm-hmm. trying to still maintain a, uh, the quality and still putting money onto the screen yeah. uh, way longer than most companies did. Yeah. Um, and still to this day, you know, he's, like you said, he's still spending more than he probably should be. Yeah. He's paying me more than he probably should be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I, I've, I've offered to, uh, to uh, relieve him of his obligation to me many, <laughs> many times saying, listen, I understand the industry has changed and, and uh, I get it if you can't pay me anymore. Yeah. You know? So, but he's, he's super, super guy, uh, and very loyal, uh, and, uh, you know, really cares about the product and, and the, and the brand name Mm -hmm. that Wicked, that Wicked comes with. Yeah. I mean, Wicked's, it's still the only studio that requires mandates condoms Condoms. and that's always been the case. And then I know that they do a lot of like advocacy stuff, like the AIDS walk, um, yeah. LA and Jessica does a lot of, yeah. I mean, Jess, Jessica and Wicked are now kind of synonymous with each other. I, I mean, I'm definitely kind of, a lot of people think I own the company, you know yeah. what I mean? Or, or I'm definitely, I'm high up, but, uh, both of us are very, um, brand, you know, injected yeah. and, and now Axel as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that many, that many nicer guys than Steve. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not. I tell him all that. Like, I'm definitely the yin to his yang. Like, I'm, I'm definitely the goof in that relationship. I love you, but I wouldn't say that you're, you're the nicest guy. You're yeah. nice to me, but you do you do tell people what you think. I'm nice to people who are nice to me. <laughs> and what more can you ask for? This is true. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Are you a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered? Of course you are. Well, I need your help to keep this show going. This is why I've set up a Patreon account where you can donate to support my show. And in exchange, you can be eligible for all kinds of cool, fun perks and prizes, which include autographed DVDs and books. See, guys, she's actually signing shit. Free membership passwords to my website, hollyrandall.com. Free mugs, pens, shirts, bags, all kinds of really cool stuff. So take care of me and I will take care of you. I will not only be able to continue to produce this 
podcast with really awesome, inspiring content about your favorite adult stars. But I will also give back to you in terms of all the cool, fun perks and prizes that we offer. So please, please support me at patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. And thank you guys so much for your support. I could not do this without you. Okay, so we're back. If somebody for some strange reason, didn't know much about Brad Armstrong. The nerve. Where would you, what movie should they start with maybe? I think I think probably the, the easiest way to do that is go to like XBiz or AVN and look up nominations. Mm-hmm. And like uh, most of my movies. Brad, are, you, know, you have so many. How is anybody going to wade through all of those? If you really want the quality <laughs> stuff, I mean, there's you know, uh, last year was uh, Lost Love was mm-hmm. a good movie. Uh, the year before that, uh, Inconvenient Mistress. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been in a little older ones is Coming Home. Um, I remember like the big party that you had for Coming Home. Coming Home was a, a you guys had a dunk tank, right? I, because I dunked I, Luke Ford in it. I rocked the dunk tank as well in a, a, a female. Uh, uh, Army chicks outfit. I had a little bra and panties and my boxers and Why my boots. Why do I boots. not remember that? Uh, look, I just remember look, dunking look, Luke because I was so happy about the if, fact if, that I did that. If you Google Brad Armstrong, <laughs> that picture pops up almost all the time. What is like one of the top first ones? Yeah, so oh. it's, you, can't, you can't fix the internet once you've got a bad picture up there, man. You never <laughs> live it down. But yeah, Coming Home was a, a really uh, a movie that I'm really proud of. Uh, that's That's one of the things I like doing is – taking um, uh, controversial topics and trying and handle them in a in a respectful way while still making it uh, uh, an erotic thriller. I was going to ask I mean? you about that because you do tap you do tackle some really like yeah. serious issues. In, uh, uh, in aftermath, it was about 9/11 mm-hmm. and one of the guys kind of a, a looking back at his life until the day he basically he's in his office and we see through his glasses the uh, the plane coming towards him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done coming home, which is uh, about the uh, veterans coming home and how their life changes. Um, Falling from Grace was uh, about a young priest who struggled with. Uh, an ex-lover who came back into his life and his calling versus uh, the woman that he loved. So we, we, we try and handle a lot of like really topical, um, tricky uh, things uh, and try and handle them as though if somebody who was really into that could still watch this movie. Mm-hmm. So also somebody could watch one of your movies without the sex scenes and it would still – it would speak to them. It would. Yeah, I mean, I in, in a perfect world, that's that's. I don't any any director who who really uh, prides himself in features. I think that's that's the end result. Is if you can watch this movie minus the sex, and it still be interesting mm-hmm. on the budget that you're doing it for. Mm-hmm. Do you ever have trouble weaving the sex scenes into the narrative? I have a pretty good good strategy as that, and like I have like a a page. I try and get. X number of pages in between sex scenes and try and not make them go too much longer than that mm-hmm. uh, between sex because after all that is what we're selling. Right. Um, but yeah, sometimes that's definitely the, the tricky thing. I, I basically, once I have my, uh, you know, your, your generic movie idea and then you start talking about, okay, who are the characters and then which one of those characters will have sex and then from there, start weaving the story in between those those sexual encounters between your your main characters. So, would you say is that like your writing um, strategy, or do you have like a specific I, way that I, you write your? I usually have it mapped out, like who my characters are and who's going to have sex, and and then start building those scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, things change. Definitely. There's, there's some fluidity to that. Uh, what's working and what isn't working. Mm-hmm. Um, when, cause sometimes you flip, flip stuff around where, oh, well, this makes sex better sense if this is, uh, scene four instead of scene five and you mm-hmm. swap things around. But I mean, for the most part, by the time I'm starting writing, I have it pretty well mapped out what's, what's happening with who and what and where. Right. What about your new series that you're doing yeah, with Jessica? Very exciting. Uh, for the first time. Jessica uh, Drake, by our, the way. Our, uh, explain fully yeah, who we're talking about. Jessica Drake. Um, I just started because now we are, our, our website is run by Gamma. Mm-hmm. And Gamma is uh, 
adult time. Uh, pure uh, you know, they're they're very way. they're very uh, episodic. Uh, yeah, related. You know, they definitely like their episodes. So uh, that was the first thing that that the switch brought was, can you? Or are you interested in doing an episodic? And I said, yeah, I'll give it a try. And the first idea I came up with, I think, was going to be really good, but it was just too many constraints on on what it was. So I came up with the new one, which is basically porn the series. And it's all the amazing and interesting tales I've heard over 30 years in porn. Uh, most of the stories uh, take place offset. Uh, I have, I do have a couple of stories that are on set just to keep it grounded in porn, but basically it's, I'm a, a big fan of Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm -hmm. So it's very much, uh, Boogie Nights, uh, Magnolia, uh, that kind of thing where you have stories that, uh, can be episodic where you, if you break that character's story off and just show that story, and that's how it's going to be shown on the website is basically four separate stories. But then on the DVD, those stories are going to be mushed together a la P.T. Uh, Anderson and uh, kind of blended together. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what we did was so they weren't kind of on top of each other. We have uh, the first four episodes are boy, girl. The second four are girl, girl. The third four are trans. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big... Uh, finale episode 13 that kind of ties all the stories up and uh it ends up in a big huge orgy of course yes with a cliffhanger ending the orgies dun 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 the orgies are like always the uh all your horror stories though come from orgy scenes so um that's good and bad you know what i mean <laughs> my, my biggest orgy was 17 people in 2040 uh the movie was 2040 i was gonna say so in the future, you've been shooting in the future. That's amazing. Well, it was very much um, Bicentennial Man, only f for a porn uh, actress. Right. So um, it uh, it basically, the, the the big orgy scene was basically at the AVN uh, Awards mm -hmm. and sex just broke out. So we had uh, the a big, huge, uh, old uh, 30s theater. Mm -hmm. And it had this big sweeping staircase and it, 17 people wow. fucking away on a staircase. Yeah. Do you struggle finding locations? Because a lot of times, like, <coughs> locations like that, they don't want to rent out to porn. Locations now are the bane of my existence. It's like, what, what, did it used to be easier? Oh, way easier. Yeah. Interesting. It was a, a right around the time that porn started getting really bad uh, news coverage with the Prop 60 and all that stuff. Uh, it really, like, like, Almost to the day it dropped off where I had I had locations that I've been using for 15 years and they go, sir, we're just not doing porn anymore. We love you, Brad. But uh, and if you ever do anything mainstream, we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. um, but we're just not taking any more porn. And then some will kind of 50 50 it where you can shoot adult there. But you can't have any sex there. Like they'll have like if you have just dialogue days, right. they'll do that. And they'll let you do that. It's just because then they can, it's like a plausible deniability where they go, oh, we didn't know that was porno. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, ch locations are definitely a huge problem. And I mean, I'm sure your viewers out there, they see a lot of the times it's the same 10, 15 houses that yeah. every porno in, in the world is made in. Um, so it's it's definitely one of one of the biggest problems. I find, I find that... Uh, Locations and sound men are my biggest problem. Really? Sound Good. Men. Sorry. Let me, let me, Good sound men. Huh. That don't drive me crazy. Interesting. I don't have to do everything four times to get it right. Really? No I offense to any of the sound men that I'm working with right now. Don't take offense. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually not really been much of an issue for me. All right. If anything, they've, I actually, one of the wicked movies that I was shooting Stranger Than Fiction, we had a horrible cricket issue that all through the dialogue and my sound guy was able to filter the fucking cricket sound out. I was so, I couldn't believe it. Crazy. I was so happy. I was, always, I was like, this movie is something. ruined always something. by a cricket. You mean there there's, shouldn't be a cricket in the nightclub? Dude, and you know, like downtown LA, huge cricket problems. Do you know I that? I did not know oh, that. I've had, you don't understand. Like locusts. I've had so many problems with crickets shooting wow. in downtown LA because they like live Same in the walls. Location? No, different locations wow. in, in LA. You can ask actually Andy and Carrie were working with me on a Twisties movie at this location in downtown LA. And we actually shot, actually for this one particular movie, we shot in two different locations and both of them had cricket problems. 
And the name of the movie was called The Artist Within, but the cricket was such an issue that we ended up calling it The Cricket Within, like as a joke on set. Because I got it. it was, and now a bunch of my assistants have the cricket noise uh, on their phone. Fuck with you. And sometimes when we're shooting, just to like freak me out, they'll play it and I'll just lose my mind. Fire them all. I can't. I love you. you know how it is. You get a crew that like you stick with the same people. I've worked with the same people for like a decade. I don't like change. They know you. They know what you like. Like it's so hard training new people for what you want. I mean, you've probably worked with the same people, right? Very long time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, your crew's everything. So t- I like to think I'm everything, and they well, just follow, we all know that. <laughs> follow the leader. But, yeah. So this new series that you're shooting, um, you said that it's based off of some stories that you've every, heard. In every porn. story in the twelve episodes is a real story that I've either heard or been involved with or know the principal characters. We have. Can you tell us any? Of no, the we're keeping. Oh, I can. Uh, I, I was going to say, I thought you were asking who the people were. Oh, no, no, no. We're no. keeping all the people uh, uh, on the down low. Uh, we, we're changing uh, either the characters or some of the situations for dramatic effect, mm-hmm. like all Hollywood movies do. Um, but basically, uh, you know, it's like some that are boys, I'm making them girls. And mm-hmm. But uh, so far, it's been pretty awesome. Yeah. And some are some are like one time stories and other ones are just stories that we've heard over and over and over through the years. And they're very, uh, very fitting for a number of the of the cast members. So they're like literally reliving their their uh, their their own stories. And and it's been been really good because they can really identify with the characters Mm -hmm. and uh, it's been very true to life. Can you give us an example of one of the stories? Um, one of them was a high-end escort who ended up getting caught smuggling her uh, her money uh, on into the country and uh, got hit with uh, the customs and things didn't go that well. Did she solve her problem? No, that would, other that means? would that would be porno if we did that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Others, the, the more generic ones are, you know, uh, the girl goes back to the dad's birthday party. It's her, it's 55th birthday. And they always have a strained relationship and she doesn't want to go. And the mom kind of coaxes her into it. And inevitably the dad can't help himself and starts fucking where they're about the porno. Um, and uh, uh, that was Megan Marks. And uh, she she brought her A game uh, and the, the crew actually clapped when she'd finished her performance uh, with uh, with dad at the, di- the dining room table. So wow. we had some really good performances. Another one, uh, Kendra Spade, mm-hmm. she uh, turns out the story that she was playing is literally her story. Mm. She grew up in a very religious family. She did. And, and uh, so the, that story is uh, where um, uh, some of the porn people from the past have uh, – uh, found God and kind of jump shipped and started doing anti porn PSAs and said how I think por- I can think of one person in particular porn, that you're talking about. Porn ruined their life and uh and then, you know, they straddle that fence uh back and forth. But basically, uh, you know, they've they've said porn ruined their life and that made them do things they wouldn't normally do and and so uh the the beginning of that story was very much uh, Kendra's story, and she did an amazing job. She had like just chunks and chunks of dialogue as she's doing the PSA and telling her story and all that stuff, and she she did it remarkably well. Uh, and then uh, uh, Jessica, because now um, uh, mental health is such a big issue, mm-hmm. she has uh, a recurring role that that the. Uh, it's kind of a vehicle that weaves through all the episodes and she's basically telling her therapist uh, stories about mm. what she's going through. And I play, uh, strange enough, because I didn't want to uh, tack this role on somebody else who might not have felt comfortable with it. I play the guy with the uh, starting to that, that long time performer who's starting to experience ED mm. and starting having problems on the set with you know, getting a hard on and, and the, uh, psychological effects that, uh, that come with that and, uh, with the struggle, whether it's through, uh, pills or injections or pumps or whatever robot else it dicks. is, robot dicks, um, basically trying to figure out 
what he's going to do with the with his issues and figure out whether he's uh, still going to continue on in the in the industry. Yeah, I could definitely see how that would be a really tough role for a guy to play because then that gets you thinking about yeah. your erection and then what if you can't perform in the scene after yeah. you do the dialogue? Like that's Yeah, well, I mean, I basically there's at least two episodes where he does like he does fail and I didn't want to put that on another performer. Yeah. Uh so that's that's something I and I thought it, it, it I haven't. He's only had one short scene yeah. so far uh, in the first uh, four episodes and uh, fails. Yeah. And uh, so I, I thought that could be a powerful role as, as the series goes on. Well, we all know, or maybe we don't all know, I know that uh, not only do you not usually ex- really experience that problem, but you step in for other people who experience that problem because one of my favorite things that – Brad tells me about, which made me laugh because I did shoot a scene at your place where there was a guy who was struggling. And after the scene was done, you told me, you're like, I could have just jumped in and done the cum shot because apparently you've done that yourself. You've been the stunt cock for like some of your own movies, right? I always have a test. Even if I'm not going to be in the movie, I always have a test because yes, I have stunt cocked and stunt popped. (laughs) For many boys in my movies, yes. Wasn't there one time where there was a guy who was struggling, and we we don't need to name names, but he kept telling you that he was going to... Can you tell this story? Two more minutes is is the war cry to (laughs) never coming. Uh, Basically, yeah, one one of the gentlemen... to, you know, to his defense, it was like 102 degrees out, and, and yeah. we're fucking. As a man, you understand, like yeah, how I think I think that that's the key is is people who direct and have never been a performer, especially male directors, yeah. that don't understand the uh, the chemistry and the mind fuck that is male performing at times when things aren't going right, mm-hmm. and are start getting angry or yelling at yeah. talent and stuff Which like never that. Never helps. It's like. You're dooming yourself. So yeah. as a male performer, I know everything that that guy's thinking before, he, especially newer talent. I, I know what they're thinking before it even pops in their head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but yeah, the one time was uh, uh, a guy and he's just like, two more minutes, two more minutes, two more minutes. And then, of course, you've got to maintain the schedule. And I'm standing there behind the cameraman <laughs> with my dick out, getting ready, <laughs> stroking my cock. It's like, Bobby, you got one more minute, dude. One more minute. And next, it's like, so I literally, we had already talked to the girl and said, everything cool. Yeah. 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 She's like, of course. Yeah. So I basically, as the cameras are rolling, push him out of the way, <laughs> come on the girl's face. And, and that's a wrap for that scene and moving on. And he's like, you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> I said, I gave you 20 minutes, dude. If you're not coming in 20 minutes, you're not coming. Wow. Yeah. Actually, Joanna Angel, uh, well, Small Hands told me that Joanna Angel told him it's a 20 minute rule. If you can't get your dick hard in 20 minutes, you need to call the scene because yeah. by then you're wasting everybody's time and it's just never going to happen. Yeah. Very, very few things happen. It's like, like they say, nothing good happens after 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the same kind of thing. Nothing never good happens after 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to happen e- either on the front end or the back end. Right. How do you handle situations like that when a guy is struggling? I mean, I always, I always wonder, I mean, obviously I'm kind and encouraging. I'm like, don't worry about it. I understand. Like, but I always wonder too, like, should I, should I make the set be completely silent or should we like carry on as normal, kind of talk a little bit so the guy doesn't feel like there's it's, this, it's, the weight of silence on him? Every dude is different. And yeah, especially when everybody's being quiet and all of a sudden you hear, it's like, oh, it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's like, because, yeah, you're just struggling. But the bottom line is, it's just, see, you have the added bonus that you could come over and, you know, show your titties a little bit and give them a little reach around. It's like, it's awkward if I do that. So <laughs> it, I've, I, I have to admit, I've never done that. Never? Oh, no. Man. I I will almost guarantee you that there's a dude who's having a hard time and he's looking over at you thinking about fucking you. Really? 100%. Oh, I wish you'd come over here and suck my cock. Oh, shut up. Trust me. I see. I don't know. I feel like I don't know. I feel like, like I've definitely done that with makeup. Like whatever the chemistry is, it's not happening there. Yeah. You go outside the box, 
And like, I've looked at makeup girls trying to get a hard on. I've looked at like <laughs> fucking extra, like whatever, you know. And then again, it's just because it's all mind fuck. It has yeah. nothing to do with your, usually with the relationship or how pretty the girl is, you know, because some girls definitely get offended when you can't get a hard on for them. Mm. And they're like, what's wrong with me? What the, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, it, it's all, you know, uh, subconscious shit that the guy's thinking and worrying about and all that stuff. And then when things do start to go wrong, then it's a whole nother game. Yeah. Uh, but like a lot of times it's just one thing that I'll look at on a girl, whether it's her calves or her boob or her neck or whatever eyes, whatever like her most appealing part is to me, you definitely, uh, start to kind of focus in on that and get your brain only focusing on that. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, if you start looking around and you see fucking dude scratching his balls and that one over there, fucking, you know, eating a sandwich and that, you know, it's just, it's just like, it's a mess. It's over. You know, what's so funny along those lines, but actually the opposite. So one of our assistants, you probably remember him. You remember like Thomas Rifter? He worked for us forever. I suck. I used names. to, I remember face forever. I used to suck. date him actually. And that's how I got the job with my mom. Anyways, so whenever we would shoot Charles Dara, Charles would always like look at him like throughout the scene, like kind of stare at him. And so he was always really freaked out about it. He's like, what is going on? Why does Charles Dara always stare at me? Like, is he gay? Like, what is it? And we used to always like laugh about it, but I never asked Charles about it. So one day I finally asked him. Actually, you put not him on your ago. podcast and you asked him about it. I don't know if I asked him on my podcast. No. I might have. But I did ask him, I'm like, what is the deal? Like, he used, you used to always stare at this guy, and he always, like, wondered why. And Charles was like, no, 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 I would look at him if I was about to pop. Uh, yeah. Because Charles is, like, the opposite. Actually, for him, he's, like, overly sensitive. Me too. I like. So he had to distract himself from yeah. coming. So he'd look at, like, the male yeah. assistant to, I, I'm, I'm a mouth to bring his boner down. I'm a mouth biter. <laughs> I bite the side of my mouth. Uh, but I'm the same thing. Like, uh I've used condoms in scenes for the last 15 plus years. Yeah. Now, if I was to do a scene without a condom, I'd, I'd be fighting not coming like three quarters of the way through the scene. Wow. You know what I mean? Like I'd be definitely be in the, so yeah, you definitely look around at, if, and look at lights and like you kind of spot yourself like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm at a scene and there's a bunch of people around as opposed to the other way when you're solely focusing on the girl mm -hmm. or whatever her body part is that, that you like. And trying to get yourself into that mode, same way on the other end, you're trying right. to get yourself out of it and go, oh, yeah, here, here, I'm snap, snap back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't envy you guys. I mean, the, the job of a male performer is, I think, underratedly difficult. I think it, once, once you're in the groove, it, it's not hard at all. Uh, now, now with the way the industry is, now it's solely uh, – and guys might disagree with me. It's just my take on it. It's solely amount of being able to recover and work so much, mm. you know, because there's guys working 20 to 25 days a month, mm -hmm. nonstop all year. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a lot of wear and tear Yeah. Uh, on your dink, your semen count, test, yeah. testosterone count, uh, a mind fuck, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, a lot of times you don't even know who the girl is you're working with till the day before the day of. Yeah. So, you know, not everybody's going to blend. So then it becomes, you know, there's days when it, when a guy, it's like, it's the best job in the world and it, you, I should be paying you. Mm -hmm. And then there's other days where, yeah, you should be paying me fucking double for this, man. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a give and take. And, you know, you want to, you want to just kind of hope that you have more good days in the month than bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. We're going to take one more commercial break and we're going to come back. Let's face it, we live in an entirely different world these days. And sometimes it's really hard to meet new people. Say hello to MyGirlFund.com. MyGirlFund allows you to form virtual relationships with sexy, fun women. On MyGirlFund.com, you can virtually meet, message, exchange photos and videos with girls in complete privacy. My Girl Fund was launched in 2009, and over the years, they've formed a community of amazing, fun, sexy women who want to meet you. My Girl Fund is completely discreet, and the girls on the website control their own exposure. These are not porn stars. These are regular girls who are looking to meet new people online and also maybe help get their college fund paid for. You can join MyGirlFund.com for free, and for a limited time, 
Get a lifetime membership for under $5 by visiting mygirlfund.com slash holly. Meet sexy, independent women and form intimate virtual relationships with them at mygirlfund.com slash holly. Brad, having been a leading man for so many years in the adult industry, you've dated some of the top stars. And one of the most notable ones um, that most people associate with the adult industry, even though she's not in it anymore, is Jenna Jameson. Jenna who? <laughs> I believe you were on her E! True Hollywood story, right? Oh, that was fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> she, I think that was like the one of the first big mainstream coverages that a porn star got, right? I mean, she got popular because of Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, she right place, right time. Because she was a wicked contract girl for a while. Yeah, for years. Uh, and then uh, uh, she just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Just just the, the way the industry was kind of, it was on that uptick where everybody was starting to do better, cooler shit. Mm-hmm. Starting to get some mainstream coverage. She got on Stern and uh, she... So blew, you really think she, Stern was the reason oh, she got famous? Stern, Stern and... Uh, and uh, our PR team, you know, oh. what I mean? this is, we had Joy King back then, who was a really good at PR. And but Stern, Stern was the step, mm-hmm. or the escalator for that matter. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, she blew up, and then you know, like all people who blow up, they start believing their own bullshit, and mm-hmm. uh, and then it's a a quick slide down the escalator. <laughs> <laughs> so what was she like to be married to? How long were you guys married for? Uh, depends on who you talk to. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, we had an interesting time together mm-hmm. and, you know, um, not all people are meant to be married. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you believe that you're one of those people? Yeah, I think so. And there again, she definitely is. Um, but Hey, you know, um, uh, she, you know, to this day, still probably the biggest porn star that ever, ever was. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, they say there's no such thing as like one big porn star anymore. And Jenna was it's the, just with was the industry. The one. Yeah, with the industry changing the way it is, you know, uh, I'd say the closest thing now is probably Angela White for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it goes in spurts. There's a cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, every five years, kind of thing. Um, there's a, a new crop that comes up and both male and female and, you know, some rise to the top and others fade away. Do you think that Jenna was kind of one of the first porn actresses that sort of broke through to the mainstream? And do you think that now mainstream covers porn a lot more than it used to? So it's not so notable? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like she definitely, like I said, right place, right time. uh, And then like anything to do with porn, they go, oh, we need to talk to Jenna. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So She's like when, a you're, mouthpiece. when you're that, uh, that much of a recognizable face, you know, mm-hmm. and then probably before, before, uh, Angela, it was Asa, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, Jessica's had some really good, uh, mainstream crossover stuff as well. Of course, Stormy, um, <laughs> has had her share of mainstream, uh, notoriety. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the thing. I, I, and, and a lot of times it was, Vivid girls, and then when when Wicked started getting really big, a lot of it was Wicked girls. Mm-hmm. That you know, like I just the people I just mentioned, it was Asa, Jessica, Stormy, mm-hmm. Jenna. Those are all four Wicked girls. I mean, like I said, Angela White is probably the latest and greatest uh, to kind of have that kind of notoriety and mm-hmm. and and stuff. And uh, other than that, it would have been maybe Jenna Hayes and Bella Donna. Yeah. You know, it, it, it goes in spurts where there's there's that girl who, yeah. who really uh, uh, kind of gets that notoriety. And then it goes to, you know, it's kind of like when the when anybody has anything to ask about uh, dudes for porno, all of a sudden they're asking Ron Jeremy. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. it's just like he's the guy that everybody noticed, you yeah. know, before that Randy Spears, you yeah. know, um, now that Randy's gone. uh, uh 
I don't know who they're asking nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> they should be asking you, but you hate interviews. You know what I mean? This is, <laughs> there's only one thing you're going to do during an interview is say something fucked up. <laughs> and so no, you can say 10 things amazing. You're going to say that the one, one fucked thing. up yeah. thing. Yeah. And that's the one that everybody's going to jump on. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that Jenna is now like a hardcore conservative Republican who just loves to bash liberals online and just be really – she just seems very argumentative. Oh, well, she's always been. She was always like a – Fiery. F- fiery is a good word for her. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, some people lose their way. That's how it happens, man. Uh, uh, a lot of times it's – people with money a lot of times it's people who are crazy yeah you know what i mean you get crazy and money mm-hmm. there's not much stopping you mm-hmm. you know you just think you all of a sudden you can say anything shit stupid shit you want to mm-hmm. uh and it's like you know like when i dated her she was living in a little one bedroom townhouse looking thing in the middle of sherman oaks food all over the floor pizza boxes for days shit laying everywhere like she couldn't have been less of a conservative yeah you know what i mean there was yeah. nothing she probably didn't know how to spell conservative you know what i mean so uh it's 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 a grown thing i mean i'm sure it's some of the uh and the men she's dated uh have molded her but i think it's more just it's the, funny the, my mom says the, cra- the exact same thing the crazy. jenna's always like whoever she's dating could be yeah uh, but I mean, crazy and money. Yeah. Look, look at anybody who who is a hardcore conservative. They're pretty much crazy, and they have money, and they just <laughs> normally like. And and anybody who's poor and conservative, it's just because they're looking up at the guy who has everything and just wants to be that dude. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're hoping that them saying stupid shit is gonna <laughs> is gonna somehow. It's like no, just play the lottery, dude. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because, you know, now you're with Jessica Drake and you guys have been together for a long time and she's so measured and I mean, at least her outward appearance calm. Um, she's very much into advocacy. She she's is passionate. trying to save the world every day. She is. And I think a lot of people don't know a lot of these things about her. I mean, does she, she, I know that she's gone and done builds in third world countries and she doesn't. She's not the kind of person who goes on Twitter and like posts pictures of herself right. doing these things. I mean, like, so a lot of people don't know like all the charity work that she's done. I mean, anybody who does good charity work doesn't talk about the charity work, right? You know, what I mean, like she's done a ton of interviews, and they always want to ask about this or that. And she goes, "Yeah, that's not what I'm here to do." Right? You know, uh, if she can bring notoriety to the project or to the to the cause, then yeah, she's all about it. But it's definitely not for self-grandizing uh, bullshit. Like, I mean, she, she killed Kilman, climbed Kilimanjaro for fuck's sakes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and almost died doing it. Like, like she came back with uh, some pretty water, waterborne uh, uh, diseases that basically she couldn't eat meat anymore. And that's part of the reason that she ended up turning vegetarian. Oh, wow. Um, because of the, the sickness that she got on the mountain. Man. So that must've been one, you must've been one hell of a nurse during that. I have done my nurse duties here and there. Yes, you have. I, I put my uh, my nice guy hat on for a couple of weeks. I can I can manage it for a couple of weeks, but, <laughs> but then it. it's then it's back to my fucking asshole self. Yeah. <laughs> and you also often design and sew a lot of her dresses yeah, for the red carpet, which a lot of people don't know. I do most of her dresses. I'd say probably about eighty percent. And if I'm not doing it from scratch, I'm definitely buying something and then completely revamping it because I'm not so much a a pattern and sewing guy. Like I can definitely use a sewing machine, but I'm not so much a dressmaker. I'm more a costume designer. Which is so cool. And that's a skill I wish that I had because you've made some amazing stuff. And you know where that started? Where? My stripper days. Really? And basically it was so hard for guys to find cool outfits mm-hmm. back then. Me and another buddy bought a sewing machine each and we learned how to, like I could make a G string, I could make pants, <laughs> I could make, I could make anything. But it's just, no, nowadays it's just not worth the yeah. time to do it. But like that's that all started from my stripper days because I was making as much money making guys' costumes during the day than I was dancing at night. Interesting. So you're getting paid by other guys to make their oh, costumes. Oh yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's my that's my f- 
my my uh, jump into uh, fashion design. <laughs> Multi skilled man. So we mentioned the name Randy Spears came up earlier, and we were talking about you know people who you know, leave porn and then come forward and say, oh, I hated it. It ruined my life. I did all these things that I didn't want to do. Um, Randy, I believe, is one of those people. He became a born-again Christian, right? And then, obviously, there's the newer Mia Khalifa interview where she talks about how porn ruined her life. How do you feel about that situation? I mean, there's there's no way you can you can argue that porn hasn't ruined some like like – some people's lives. Right. You know what I mean? But it's the same as fucking, you know, football or boxing or yeah. any, any other sport or any, any other career. And those have caused like serious physical injuries and, and, to people and, and, that. And, and, and as, as porn, there's definitely people who have contracted yeah. HIV and stuff. So, I mean, mm-hmm. the bottom line is, but you can't, you can't say that porn's this big beast of a fucking life killer when you compare it to a lot of other things, you know, race right. car drivers, there's, there's inherent risks that you take in any career that you're gonna gonna do, and you know, uh, with the amount of money that that people get paid uh, in the adult industry, uh, you know, there's there's an assumed risk, and you're deciding to take that on for the money that you're making. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and I, I, could, I could wait around and shit and be a plumber all day, but that doesn't seem like that much fun. Plumbers make a great living, but it's not something I choose to do, right? But you know, it's it's one of those things where people choose to get in porn. Nobody ever, uh, what's it, I'll rephrase that. Not too many people are coerced and or tricked into doing adult. Mm-hmm. I get people that that like uh, uh, calling it seventeen and a half, going, "Hey, on my eighteenth birthday, I want to come in and and fucking audition for you." Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's hardly someone who who's being coerced into into becoming a porn star. Didn't Heather Hunter do her very first scene on her 18th birthday? I'm not sure. That, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's right. correct. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's been a number of girls who have. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, can people say that life life has been ruined by by being in the adult business? Yeah, but I mean, I, I'd say on an average. Uh, like you, like me, like a number of other people who have been doing it for decades, you know, obviously we have no problem with it. It certainly hasn't ru- ruined our life. It's certainly afforded me a great living over the last 30 years. I'm, I'm the first millionaire in my family, mm-hmm. you know, I'm the first college graduate, you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. a lot of people in porno have done other things and, and will do other things after this is all over. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of nurses, a lot of uh, EMTs, a lot of, you know, finance people a lot of people are just whatever they were doing beforehand just decided it wasn't for them and they've decided to enter the the field of adult video it's interesting that you brought that up and especially like the nurse and emt thing because when i was listening to the mia khalifa interview what i noticed a lot of her complaining about was not necessarily porn specifically like on set i think she even talked about how on set she was generally really well respected by the male talent but it was the stigma that followed her afterwards. So I wonder if a lot of the damage isn't necessarily porn itself, but the way society treats you if you've done porn. Because there's those stories of um, – there's that one girl. I can't remember her name. I know that Gustavo at Expos wrote an article about it. Oh, she did a little bit of porn. She left. She went into nursing. And then they found out that she'd done porn and she lost her job. She lost everything. There was also, I think Dale DeBone Dale DeBone as as well. Same thing happened to him. It's, it's it's a common thing. And, uh, a lot of times, obviously when you're in the business and making money and having fun, when that stigma, um, hits you, a lot of times you're way easier uh, and way more equipped to go, fuck you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm making a great living. What are you driving? You know what I mean? You, you can kind of justify it to yourself. But when you leave and you're trying to be, quote, normal uh, and trying to start a new life and it follows you, I think that's when you really notice it because you're like, fuck, man, I got out of it to start anew and you're not letting me. Mm-hmm. You want to you want to shit talk me when I'm in the business. Yeah. Now you want to shit talk me out of it. It's like, you know, it's like uh, it's a tricky thing. I, I mean, I, even me, I'm fairly successful, I think. I deal with it um, here and there, and it's usually only when I'm trying to do something more mainstream. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I started doing a little bit of script writing and it's certainly I'm not using the Brad Armstrong moniker on yeah. the top of that page. And that's why script writing makes sense because it's not my face they're seeing. It's what's on the page. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just starting actually just today I got a call and it's uh, it's a book that's been written about uh, someone. It's autobiographical and uh, someone I know kind of gave him uh, it's a script. It's a story about his dad that he wants to tell fairly uh, well known in his in his field and in his small town, uh, they gave him a script that uh, me and Tommy Gunn actually wrote, mm-hmm. uh, mainstream script uh, that was supposed to be for Sylvester Stallone, and the way things worked out, it didn't happen. But um, uh, it's a story called Long Road Home, mm-hmm. and it's very similar in the in the kind of that small town feel and the characters and stuff like that. And she gave it to the. Uh, uh, the guy and uh, the son's interested in doing the story mm-hmm. and, and said he wanted to meet me after reading my script. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I can say who I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, even though, even though that stigma uh, may not be blatantly slapping me in the, in the face, I know it's right behind me. Right. You know, and that's with somebody who's in my world, you know, fairly successful. Yeah. I can, I can go into any boardroom. I'm not the most well-spoken guy, but I certainly can hold my own in any conversation. Mm -hmm. And, and still, if that was to come up, that would change uh, a lot of people's mind. And I'm, I'm used to it from when I was 17, when I was, when I was in college, because I was dancing at night. Mm -hmm. That dancing stripping is the same kind of stigma that you get as a porn star. Yeah. It's it's kind of like sex. None of my professors took me seriously because they found out that I was dancing at night and they're like, Oh, you're not, you're fucking you're not taking this seriously you're not looking yeah. you're not looking for a career right so i mean i've i dealt with that since i you know yeah since i was 18 19 yeah i i wonder if that because of that situation and exactly what you just said you know they people shit on you when you're doing it and they tell you, you need to get out of porn and then you get out of porn and you try to do something else and society blocks you at every turn because they're like oh you're a porn star you were a porn star we can't you can't do these things that you have to turn around and take like a 180 approach like Randy Spears and being like, I regret it. I'm so sorry. I need to be redeemed. Like, please forgive me world for ever having been in porn. And, and, and they're good. I, like I need a second chance. And I, re- if that's really how you feel, then that's great. But if you're just doing it to get by, then you're only fooling yourself. You know. True, but I also wonder if there's some confusion between whether or not that's how you really feel or if – because, again, it's like the pressure of the way society sees you. You know, they could change – if you're trying – if you leave the porn world, we're a very small, like, insular community, and you leave the porn world and you try to make it out in the real world and all you get is all this shit from tons of people, of course it can make you change your mind about what you did for a living and maybe see your background as something that was – you know, more, I don't know, what's the word, um, more toxic and damaging than you initially felt. I mean, I don't want to speak for these people. I don't know and, what their experience they're, was like. They're, but they're, it's, it's like when you're doing it for decades, you know, obviously your your experience in the industry itself changes. Right. You know, what, what was fun at the beginning, then it became work, then it became fucking treachery when you weren't making as much money. And then it was like, then oh, you fuck, do I get out? Do I, and then it, you... You know, it's, 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 it's like any, any, any career, like they say you change careers every 10 years or whatever on an average, but yeah, I've I've been in the business 30 years. Yeah. Obviously my career has changed and and been a little fluid as I've gone, but it's still like, I'm still here. Like I'm, I'm, even though I may talk shit about porn and what porn is today, Mm -hmm. I would never talk shit about my time in porn Mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm. I'm more defending porn now when I, when I'm talking shit, I'm going, you guys have fucked this bitch up. Yeah. This is like, this was your daughter. You the fucking sent her out and had her fucking <laughs> <laughs> sold her for fucking a dollar a piece and yeah. let everybody come and steal her for free. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm being more defensive about porn. And, and I, when I got into it, I, I loved porn, mm-hmm. you know? Um, You're right. And, I mean, and that's, and that's part of the whole point of, of the porn series is these stories and some of them are definite, definitely stigma related, uh, whether it's the family or new employers or, you know, just in general life, uh, and, and the issues people face because they've, they've joined the, the wonderful world of porn. Mm-hmm. 
What do you think is the biggest change that you've seen in your 30 years? Uh, the internet killed porn. Let's face it. Let's <laughs> face it. As much as it's put us out there and now everybody knows who, what, where, when, everybody's doing shit. Which isn't necessarily always it's a good thing. Horrific. Because people you know? have no anonymity anymore. Yeah, and I'm I'm doing, I'm, I'm making, a, putting out a movie on fucking Friday. By Monday, that's bouncing off some Ukrainian satellite fucking for free. And and how do you make money at that? Yeah. You know, when everybody can watch it for free, I'm still amazed that anybody's joining any sites yeah, like you sound exactly like Quasar when you say that, yeah, but it's, 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 yeah. it's beyond. If I could get like if if my neighbor had a fucking bunch of different fruit trees and he said, come on over and pick them whenever you want. What the fuck am I going to the grocery store? <laughs> like for what? Well, maybe better, more consistent quality at the grocery store. Maybe you really like the checker at the grocery store and you want to support the grocery store because you don't want her to lose her job. There's a lot of people who buy porn now specifically because oh, they no. want to support the, the industry the and only, performers. The only reason that porno will survive is that one-on-one -on -one fan base that thinks they're they're having a relationship, whether it's friends or want to be lovers or whatever it is, uh, that they really appreciate that porn star for what she is and what she does, and they're get like. Any man, sooner or later, they'll be fickle and change to the girl and this girl and that girl. And, and, and then, you know, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing where porn lands, mm. you know. So you and, don't have any predictions. And the massive, the massive takeovers that are going on. Yeah, it's you know becoming I mean? like a monopoly. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and that's, I, I don't know, there was, that was the plan all along, obviously, I'm going to guess. But it's, it's interesting. That I, I would be interested in seeing what porn looks like in five years. But I've been saying that for 15 yeah. You know, ever since internet came, like I, I, I knew that this internet was the downfall of porn, mm. uh, as as I knew it. Right. You know what I mean? Obviously, it's been the upside for many, many, many people. Right. Uh, but for me, as a feature director, porn has has definitely not been my friend. Mm. Well, Brad, I'm glad you're my friend. Do you like that little segue? Thanks for your titties. You're welcome. Like I said, they're just like trying perched, to keep your attention. They're perched right on the edge of the table like that. It's awesome. <laughs> Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? More importantly, check out all my stuff at wicked.com. Uh, that's where the more important shit is. Mm -hmm. The uh, Wicked Armstrong on Twitter is me just spouting off or showing uh, dog videos and shit. You also uh, like promote your new movies Of course, you have to promote nowadays. It's all about the promotion. Mm -hmm. I think some people spend more time... Uh, uh, doing little clips for their movies and they do shooting their movies. I know, right? <laughs> Promos everything. Yep. Are you even on Instagram? No, I, I have one set up. Uh, I haven't touched it in. Yeah, it looks very not updated. Yeah. Uh, I, why do you, you look for hot pictures of me on there? Yes, yes. Because I couldn't possibly find them on wicked.com or yeah. anything like that. Uh, yeah, I haven't touched my Instagram in probably two years. Okay. I had to guess. So Wicked Armstrong on Twitter is the place to find you. And of yes. course, Wicked.com. If you have com. any important questions, feel free to ask Wicked Armstrong.com. All right. On Twitter. <laughs> at Twitter. Wicked Armstrong. Com, oh whatever. my God. Look at you. I'm old. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on. This really meant a lot to me. You are truly like one of my face. Stop staring at my tits. You are just truly looking at your hand <laughs> placement. <laughs> sure. You're literally. <laughs> You are truly one, <laughs> one of my favorite people in this industry. I really do adore you and Why do everything you keep it that you so cold me in with. here. Your nipples are like it, literally it has, popping. It's actually up. this the entire building is like on one setting. We can't wow. control it. It's really annoying. Um, but hey, I'm trying to talk about how much I love you, and you quit. You're stop sh interrupting you're showing me. Showing me with those nipples, how much you love me, baby. <laughs> it's all good. Words words oh mean nothing. <laughs> Well, anyways, I'm just, I'm just going to keep saying the words. I don't care. Um, I adore you. I think you're wonderful. Actually, I didn't even tell this story, but Brad's penis was the first live penis that I ever saw on a porn set back when I was 20 years old. I had just started working for my mom, and she finally allowed me to come to set to shoot some behind the scenes. I was shooting it. I was trying to do something artsy. I was shooting on infrared film because we shot on film back then. And um, it was Brad and 
Azlea Antistia. Is that how you pronounce her last Artesia, name? Artesia, yeah, something like that. In a red convertible Cadillac? Beige. Was it beige? I think I was wearing a red tie or red red banded fedora. That it maybe was a 30s, that's, 30s the 30s and red. 40 things. And she was, I think she may have been in red too. Yeah, or like a red bow. Really it's nice, on Sue's net. Really, really, uh, yes. By all means, check out Sue's net for Sue's all net your- is a lot of old you, Brad you can, content. You can see how, how young and pretty I was back in the 90s. <laughs> Boom. But yeah, my first uh, time on a porn set ever. And it was it was Brad's penis that I saw. And here your, we are. Was that your first penis ever? No. No. Not at 20. Not at 20. Come yeah. On. yeah it's just, I lost my virginity at 16 and it was- uh, yes. whore! Party time since then. Well, I guess you you really haven't having a uh, a pornographer for your for a mom. You kind of had a lot of leeway there when it came to sexual exploits. Yeah, they it's were. not like she could give you bullshit, right? <laughs> yeah, especially considering what a whore my mom was when she was younger. And I say that with all the Due affection respect, and love. Of course, but I found she my, was very promiscuous. I felt mine was too. She like. Had dated a bunch of the Toronto Maple Leaf hockey players and stuff. Good for her, Bill, one of the guys from Bill Haley and the Comets, and wow! Yeah, at, at her funeral, everybody started telling me these horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on. Always lovely to see you. And you guys can follow me at Instagram. Or oh, wait, no, I got to look here, Ernie. Right? Fuck. Sorry, we have a new camera setup. Sorry, confusing. You can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filter to support this podcast. Facebook group is facebook.com slash group slash Holly Randall. And don't forget to go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where I am clocking 2 million views a month now. Wow. It's the only reason that Brad came on. Such a marketing guru. Hey, man, you got to. You got it. You got to work it. You know how it is these days. Pay for those bras. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not my bras. Not doing much. It keeps poking out. All right, Brad. Thank you again so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>